welcome today to our teletherapy webinar. This is um, the first in a four-part series that we are presenting over the next few months. We have another one next week and then one in October and November, and that will complete um, the series for our new practitioner's guide to um, teletherapy. Today, we are going to have the main instructional portion of the workshop, and then we'll follow up with some time for Q&A. You'll be given instructions toward the end of the workshop today to complete a webinar survey and the post-workshop exam so that you'll be able to um, get your certificate of attendance, and we'll have some more details on this here in a few minutes as well. Just a few things um, before we get started. There is a participant worksheet that accompanies this webinar, and that was emailed to you in your um, reminder email this morning or yesterday. We'll also are going to put that into the chat here in just a few moments. Um, please feel free to use the chat box to comment or ask questions or that Q&A box. We will have a few times where we will be asking for responses in the chat. Um, but we also encourage questions there as well. So we'll, we'll definitely have time to answer any of those questions. Also, you can turn on closed captioning for this webinar. There is a, a button below um, it says CC, and that will allow you to enable that function for yourself if you want to um, have that enabled to be able to read as well. And just a reminder, this is being recorded today. If you were not able to get the participant worksheet earlier, I'm gonna put that into the chat right now. Um, this is a great way to follow along. We have our learning outcomes there as well as some other um, uh, participant things that you'll be doing and that we'll be talking about today. So I'm putting this in the chat right now. And again, to get the most out of this workshop, you'll wanna use those participation guides to take notes and do the activities that we have planned for us to do together. And then finally, just being active in that chat. And for those of you who are not a part of our Eluma clinician community, we are really happy to have you here today. Eluma was founded 12 years ago by our current CEO, uh, Jeremy Glauser. At Iluma, we are on a mission to provide better support for schools so that you can create success stories with students. Iluma connects students and educators with clinicians who care, and we also provide software solutions to support mental health, speech therapy, OT, PT, and school psychology. Let's go ahead and get to know each other a little bit better. So just a little bit about us. Uh, my name's Cammie. I'm an occupational therapist. I've been in OT for over 25 years. I've worked in a lot of different settings, um, but I've spent most of my time as a school-based OT. Um, I also have been doing teletherapy since about 2015. Um, and so um, I have a lot of experience with that as well. And that's why I'm really excited to present this um, workshop today. Hello, everyone. I'm Paula Morrison, and I'm a school psychologist and I've been in the field for about 25 years most of it in the brick and mortar setting and most recently as a remote school psychologist with Iluma. My background is in early childhood education and I've also worked with adults with disabilities at the university level. Um, I currently serve as a mental health uh, specialist in the clinician clinical ser services department here at Iluma. Welcome everyone. Nice to have everybody with us today. I'm Sarah Plunkett. I've been a speech language pathologist for about 15 years uh, in various settings. Um, pretty much everywhere we can work as, as speech therapists actually, including the public schools and recently teletherapy. Um, I actually contracted with Iluma for a couple years as a clinician before transitioning to my current role as a clinical services specialist. Awesome. So next we want to hear um, a little bit about you. So I'm going to have a poll that's going to launch on your screen. Just go ahead and click the most appropriate um, response there. Just like to see um, where every what everyone is doing and then we'll share that as well. All right, I'll share those results. Terrific. So we have a lot, yeah, a lot of SLPs, OTs, mm -hmm. and mental health providers today. Great. All right. 
next, the next poll, um, just to know a little bit about where you all are working. This will help us, um, let's see. Oh, I need to stop the other one. This will let us know just what kind of um, schools you're in right now. I'd like to give everybody enough time to answer there. So it looks like we have um, a lot of people who might be considering working in the schools or maybe just wanting to um, learn more about teletherapy in general. And today's webinar is pretty general mm -hmm. as far as teletherapy goes. And then for those of you that are in schools, um, what are the primary grades that you're working with? even yeah these are pretty even so it looks like we have all of the all of grades pretty evenly covered here all right and then you have one more just what's your comfort level today with teletherapy All right, great. Well, I hope we'll have, we'll definitely have something for everyone today. Um, again, this is kind of an introduction. And then as our series goes on, um, the next three um, are really going to dive pretty deep into some of the other aspects as far as legal and ethical considerations, and then looking more into those modalities and things that we can do. But um, we will go ahead and get started here today. Uh, thanks for filling out that participation poll. That also gives you a chance to practice with those polls. We will have a few more coming up um, just to kind of test some knowledge and see where we're at as we go through learning today. Before we get started, we need to go over a few items. This is the first of a four-part series of our Telepractice Boot Camp, an introductory level webinar series on school-based teletherapy. All presenters are affiliated with Iluma Online Therapy Services, a provider of school-based services. Presenters do not endorse nor receive any compensation from any products or services included in this presentation. You can receive a certificate of attendance for today's webinar. In order to receive it, you must attend this, this course in its entirety and complete the post-webinar survey, evaluation, and test. This course is also eligible for one NASP Continuing Professional Development credit upon passing the post-course evaluation. Here is what we're going to learn today. You can find these outcomes listed in your handout. As an engaged participant, this is the knowledge you will walk away with at the end of this workshop. You'll be able to define three key terms related to teletherapy. You will describe two examples of synchronous versus asynchronous teletherapy methods. And you will be able to summarize evidence-based practices for teletherapy. So let's get started. We have a lot of material to cover today and we wanna make sure we cover it all and be able to answer any questions you may have. Let's start with the key terms in teletherapy. So these are the key terms we'll discuss today and we will go through each one of these uh, in more detail as well. Telehealth versus teletherapy, telepractice sessions and evaluations, platforms, digital assets and or materials, asynchronous versus synchronous sessions, on-site versus homeschool, bandwidth, encryption, and also digital literacy.
So the CDC does define uh, telehealth as a service that uses video calling and other technologies to help you see your doctor or healthcare provider from home instead of at a medical facility. Telehealth may be particularly helpful for older adults with limited mobility and also those living in rural areas as they will have the opportunity to see and talk with their doctor from home. The telemedicine and telerehabilitation service area began providing remote or mobile health services through devices at a patient's home that would gather and store their data to relay to healthcare physicians. Telepsychiatry and teleneuropsychology services were being provided as early as 2015. The various types of virtual services can be confusing, so today we're going to focus on school-based teletherapy services for the purpose of this webinar. Teletherapy services can include mental health, behavior support, speech, occupational, and physical therapies. As early as 2015, practitioners in the medical field began remo using remote devices to monitor patient health, and research involving teleneuropsychology assessments were also noted as early as 2015. School-based speech and language services began as early as 2011, and the many benefits of teletherapy services include efficiency, greater access to high-quality services, reduced waiting times, and consistent, reliable support services within the school environment, thus decreasing caregiver transportation demands. So now we're going to test our knowledge a little bit of teletherapy terms. Telehealth and teletherapy are interchangeable terms, true or false. So the answer there would be false. We want to use those differently because telehealth would refer to just the medical field and the use of teletherapy or in telehealth there. Okay. For a successful telepractice session, there are a few considerations to take into account when beginning your practice. Of course, we all think about those things like Wi-Fi and internet, and these are really important. And you really wanna make sure that you're understanding the limits of your service based on the demands of streaming, um, or which we also call bandwidth of your internet. So for example, if your internet cannot sustain video streaming of several videos at one time, you may need to make sure that only one device in your household is streaming when you are in a session because it can really degrade the quality of your video and the things that you're trying to share. If you're able to have high speed internet, this is going to be optimal for telepractice and will help avoid those slow or glitchy sessions where you can't hear or the video is cutting in and out. You do always want to make sure that you have a backup plan for when your router or modem is not working properly. Um, you may want to consider using your phone data or hotspot in the case of an emergency, but just know that this may disrupt those videos, that video stream, and you may be limited to audio only. Along the lines of that Wi-Fi and internet capability is the importance of encryption. The process of encryption provides a safeguard against someone else accessing electronic data from you or your client or student. Utilizing a platform that is HIPAA, FERPA, and COPPA compliant is important, and this will help ensure your compliance with protecting student data. When choosing a platform or subscription level, it's recommended that you will choose one that does provide this encryption. And we'll talk about this more as we continue this webinar series, especially the next webinar where we go into legal and ethical considerations. To maintain confidentiality during a session, be aware of your surroundings and those of your client. It's helpful to send a tip sheet on how to prepare for a session so that they're aware of the expectation. So for example, ask the client to be prepared to wear headphones, choose a private location, so maybe don't get on at your local coffee shop, and minimize distractions. You also wanna pay attention to your room configuration, your background and lighting, and any visual distractions that might be behind you. 
You will want your client to also have good lighting if possible and those quiet surroundings and minimal distractions as well. Video appearance is important, whether the session is synchronous or asynchronous. Neutral colors are a good option as patterns on clothing may be distracting or may not come across well on the video. And again, that lighting is important. You wanna check for shadows or any features that are going to be washed out by lighting that is too bright. So a lot of times you'll see um, someone sitting in front of a window um, where the window is actually, you know, coming in behind them. And that can cause a lot of problems with the video and being able to see you or see, especially if you're doing any kind of speech therapy or things where people are going to need to be able to see your face or see what you're trying to show on your video camera. And check and make sure that audio is sufficient and you want to make sure there are no sound delays or echoing going on. So we have our next uh, test your knowledge check here as well. And I'll launch this poll one moment. So this question, um, bandwidth refers to um, which of these is correct? Is it the physical size of the modem, the level of internet subscription service, the maximum capacity of the wired or wireless communications link, or the inability to view videos or upload videos. All right, in that poll. And yes, most of you have the correct answer. It is the maximum capacity of the wired or wireless communications link. And our next question, which location provides an optional, optimal location for a video uh, virtual setting? Oh, hang on here, we have the wrong. <laughs> Things got out of order, one moment. Here we go, here it is. Let me get back to this end of this one and then I can, there we go. So which location provides an optimal, optimal space for a virtual setting? Coffee shop, school cafeteria, kitchen, or a private quiet location with minimal distractions? I know this one can be hard sometimes, especially um, if you're in a situation where you're doing some hybrid work and you're working with in-person clients or students and also with virtual clients. Um, so you do wanna make sure that you can either put up some kind of a divider or something if you're not able to be in your own home or location. Great. All right. So now we'll move into scheduling our sessions, um, both therapy sessions and assessments. So once you've decided on your platform, it's time to schedule your session. And several practitioners utilize various apps such as Calendly or Google Calendar, MS Teams, or, or even just an email. What's important is that the link to that session is kept confidential and sent directly to the client. Don't post it on a social media group or a public website. The link to your virtual therapy room should be sent directly to the client. It's important to follow any school or contract company uh, policies and procedures regarding client communication of information related to those therapy sessions and scheduling. Explore the various uh, online games, activities, and prompts for student breaks and warm ups. Some platforms already provide access to interactive games, but you may want to look at the use of virtual therapy rooms or even discussion prompts. It's helpful to begin a session with an engaging activity as well as provide breaks based on the student's age and ability to attend to the session. When you're assessing students via a virtual platform, make sure your assessment meets the equivalent standards for teleassessment. Digital assessment should not be altered in any way and must be accessed through the test publisher. Do not scan, screenshot, or create your own version of a digital uh, test. 
uh, of any standardized assessment, only the test publisher can provide you with the digital assessment as it is formatted in a specific way to maintain standardization. Please refer to the test publishers for the availability of digital assessments. Practicing and setting up your environment is critical to a smooth session. So just as we talked about uh, distractions earlier, your e-helper or facilitator can help you figure out the right time of day or the right location. If you're conducting assessment, plan ahead and make sure that your client has all the response booklets they need, uh, the equipment that they may need. Have your test record form and digital assets, timers, and audio files prepped ahead of time and ready to go. It's helpful to have a practice session with a colleague prior to conducting your session. You should be very familiar with your test materials prior to the evaluation. This is not the time to try out a new test that you've never administered before. The test publishers may also offer additional information on testing session setup. In some cases, when you do work with that facilitator or e-helper, you'll need to make sure that they understand the expectations of that evaluation session. So let's uh, go ahead and test your knowledge. Here's our first one. Test publishers will allow you to take a screenshot of the stimulus book or and screen share it. Okay. Looks like we have everyone answered and the answer is false. Let's not do that, <laughs> violate any copyrights. <laughs> and then we'll move on into our next one. The facilitator can administer test materials for the clinician or on your behalf. 100% answered yet, almost. Okay, the answer on that would be false. Um, your facilitator is there to assist you, but not actually administer the test. All right, let's talk a little more about those virtual platforms. While there are platforms that do offer a free service, Oftentimes that free service only allows for a certain amount of time, maybe a certain amount of sessions. So you want to take the time to compare plans um, on virtual platforms, as well as safety features and settings. For Zoom, there are various levels of services, and we recommend that you choose the security level that ensures that COPPA, HIPAA, and FERPA compliance that we mentioned earlier. End-to-end -end encryption ensures that your information is not being accessed by anyone else and keeps all your communication secure. Make sure your platform is updated before your session. That's always a good thing to check. When you're hosting, you can utilize the waiting room feature to ensure the right people are waiting to be let in. And you can block the entry of others who are outside of your approved group. You can also disable the audio, video, and chat features of others in the groups if you need to do that. Zoom does offer additional safety features on its website which uh, this link is listed on your participation worksheet. There's some great information there as far as safety features and also some support articles on Zoom. Google Meet also utilizes encryption and again secures COPPA, FERPA, and HIPAA related information. Uh, this platform does utilize the Google Calendar for your invites, so just be sure you're on the right Google Calendar. I know a lot of us have more than one Google account um, personally, and maybe even within our household. So just be sure you are on um, the right um, Google account there. You can set up a meeting code as you can in Zoom. However, there might not be a waiting room feature available depending on um, your Google account there. Only users on the calendar invite will be able to access the platform. So make sure you've got the correct email addresses there as well. Sharing and annotation capabilities are limited within Google Meet. And then MS Teams has groups and channels uh, similar to Zoom. You know, conversations can be held within those channels. Uh, you can call in participants. There is very tight integration with MS products, so that might be a challenge for Mac users. 
um, MS Teams appears to have greater usage for collaborative work. So messaging, team meetings, uh, shared notes, that type of thing. This platform is less likely to be used for a therapy session, but maybe for a team um, group work of some sort or meetings. So now we can test our knowledge on this information a little bit. Which of the following virtual platforms are most commonly used for teletherapy sessions? We've got a few choices here. Zoom, Google Meet, FaceTime, Skype, MS Teams. Give everybody a minute to make those choices. Pretty good there. Yeah, Zoom, Google Meet, and MS Teams. Okay. So next we want to talk a little bit about digital assets and what this means. And digital assets are the digital or electronic form of any assessments, activities, or materials that would otherwise have been used in printed formats. For standardized assessment materials, like Paula said, it's important to only use the test publisher's digital assets as they are specifically formatted for digital use. And since COVID, um, many of the publishers now have a lot of assessments that are available um, via digital methods. So it's important to make sure that you are using the correct and the um, valid digital asset uh, because you don't want to um, invalidate any standardized scores or anything that you would get from those assessments. But outside of assessments, um, all other materials are have really been um, gaining ground. When I first started doing teletherapy in 2015, it was a whole different world, especially for OT. I was having to make a lot of my own um, activities and come up with my own things that I could use that were interactive online. And now that is so, so much better and so different with the um, things that are available on things like boom cards. I know SLPs love ultimate SLP tools to grow OT really um, broadened their interactive activities during COVID and since then. Um, and a lot of clinicians are creating their own templates, their own activities or different prompts that can be used for digital use. So this has been an amazing advancement. Um, when you are using um, those materials, remember to take into consideration on how your client will be viewing the materials. So if your client is going to be viewing them from a cell phone or an iPad, they may be formatted differently than the way you would use them on a computer. I know the iPad can be difficult to um, annotate and be interactive for the student. It requires a couple different clicks that a lot of our students may not have the physical or um, other capabilities to work through those or, or have an e-helper that would be able to help them. There are also many social media groups that share resources and materials, so I encourage you to go out and try to find these groups so that you can um, you know, continually be updated on these new materials. Virtual platforms such as Zoom and Google Meet do now have virtual games embedded into the platform. Some are free and some require an additional fee. And national organizations such as ASHA, AOTA, and ASCA also have references for digital materials that may be helpful for you. We're going to go through a few case studies um, for OT, speech, and mental health and kind of show some of the things that we would use in a situate in a session with a student. So for OT, um, if I have a student, his name might be Milo. He's a six-year-old boy with handwriting concerns. He's unable to write more than a few words, and his then his handwriting becomes illegible. His grasp is not functional and he displays poor letter formation. And on an evaluation, we found that he has some um, decreased fine motor strength along with some academic needs. And we wrote um, goals for him for letter formation and fine motor endurance. So these are some examples of some of the digital materials that I might prepare for a session. There are a lot of great videos on YouTube. And it can be really hard to show our hands, especially as OTs, um, within the camera and make sure that the student is watching that. So videos are a great way to kind of replace um, that side-by-side -side activity that you would normally do with a student. 
Um, I love the OT closet on YouTube. There are um, dozens of really nice finger exercises that you can either do with some manipulatives like a pencil or without. And so you can find um, YouTube videos to replace some of the things that you would normally do side by side. Additionally, there are a lot of letter formation lessons that you can find on YouTube. This is just an example of an interactive digital teaching tool from Learning Without Tears. And then I also like to use a website called printablepaper.net. When I'm doing a letter activity, um, this is paper that is free. You can download it as a PDF. They have everything from just standard notebook paper to some specialized paper like highlighted paper and things like that that you can download free as a PDF or you can um, so that you can email it to the facilitator or parent. But you can also screen share and show that PDF and then do your handwriting lessons on that as well. And then for follow-up activities, PBS games is a lot of fun um, or doing something kind of at the end just as a free choice. There are a lot of games like this that we can um, use online as well. So as far as speech therapy goes, this case study involves a kindergarten student receiving speech language services. Hayden is a five-year-old kindergarten student with articulation and language needs. He was evaluated for school-based services and was found to have difficulties with his K and G sounds, as well as categorizing like items and following directions. His speech infects, affects his intelligibility within the classroom, and he also has difficulty following instructions from his teacher. So now let's consider how we might address this student's needs uh, within teletherapy. As Cami said, there's a lot of great stuff out there that we can use, um, you know, within our sessions. I personally like to start uh, sessions by introducing kind of the activities for the day, the goals that we're going to work on, reminding students of, of why they're coming to therapy, just as we would in person. Um, books, games, picture scenes are really great for targeting multiple goals. Um, as Cami mentioned, PBS Kids is a great uh, site. There's a lot of great um, information out there on, on YouTube, as, as she mentioned. And this is just one example, a highlights magazine that we might all remember from uh, when we were kids uh, has a great website now. There's games, activities, picture scenes, uh, jokes that the kids really find uh, funny. This hidden pictures activity is perfect for working on both articulation and language goals. Students can click on the big picture. Um, they're searching for those hidden items within the big picture. So articulation students can always practice their sounds um, at various levels, you know, word, phrases, sentences, once they find these pictures. And then language students can address various goals. You know, they can put like items together in categories. They can follow directions, uh, just as in our case study example, where the student really needed uh, help with those items um, to help him in the classroom. And in the area of mental health, our, our uh, case study here is Sandra. And she's a 10 year old student who was referred to the school counselor due to a recent panic attack at school. Her administrators and her teacher were aware that things were different at home and at school, uh, but she had a positive circle of friends and no discipline history. However, an incident occurred and she became unusually quiet and isolated. And then she experienced a panic attack during math class. So her classroom teacher referred her to the MTSS team for social emotional interventions. <clears throat> and in a situation like this, a counselor or a mental health provider may opt to use a cognitive behavior therapy approach by helping Sandra understand her stress and anxiety. Um, there are sites like castle.org and the Center on PBIS that uh, often supply various lessons or activities. A clinician may use ready-made templates or videos to teach coping skills such as deep breathing. Here is an example of one um, that was found in YouTube. I created this using a platform using Canva, but if you were to go and search for virtual therapy rooms or online activities, stress, debrief, um, anxiety. You'll find all kinds of different resources available. Since, since the pandemic, there's been a large addition to the library of support and, and products and activities and, and videos. 
uh, by helping Sandra discover strategies uh, and understanding her anxiety, she can utilize these coping skills in her day-to-day -day routine. And so just as everyone mentioned before, there are some great games and activities Activities like uh, PBS Kids, there's the Hot Wheels, there's Lego Builder, there's creative ones such as paint and color. Um, these are great in to engage your students at the beginning of the session and at the end of the session for free time. But uh, don't be hesitant to go out and research how you can create your own as well. So now we're going to look at uh, asynchronous versus synchronous. We mentioned that uh, kind of in our learning objectives to start. Asynchronous communication is when information is exchanged or gathered at a separate time. An example of this might be sending an assignment to a client or student to complete on their own time. Then they would send it back to you uh, at a later date for review. Another example might be an independent study or an online study course. The instructor could upload assignments, videos, lectures, uh, things like that for students to review on their own time. And there's no scheduling required here. An example of an asynchronous session would be an online class that is recorded by the instructor and available for you um, to access at any given time. These can also include emails, chats, discussion boards, or recorded videos. Synchronous is live real-time interaction. So just like this webinar, these types of sessions require scheduling and prior preparation for any tasks that you're gonna be giving to your students or clients. Telemedicine and teletherapy or telerehabilitation are all examples of synchronous sessions. Communication is always live and interaction is taking place in real time. So this is just a basic example of the differences in asynchronous and synchronous sessions. Here you can see how the session changes based on the format, but it's still always going to align with the student's goals. So asynchronous, we might have our high school pragmatic student that's assigned a video clip to review and take notes on interactions, targeting goals, maybe turn taking or on topic responses, asking follow up questions, that type of thing. So the SLP is going to review those notes and offer recommendations at the next um, time they meet up maybe. For synchronous, that same pragmatic student is going to log into their regularly scheduled session. They will watch a video clip with the SLP. So it's real time. They're talking about the goals and, and the things that they need to address uh, kind of while the video is playing, stopping, starting, pausing as you need to, things like that. They're going to identify those goals within the video together. So the session will continue with independent practice of the goals with the SLP following the watching of that video. So we want to pause and reflect a little bit now. We've got, um, you know, we mentioned your participation worksheet earlier. Using that, take a few moments. We'll give you a few minutes here. Consider how you might use asynchronous and synchronous models within your specific discipline. Uh, we would love to hear what you come up with. Um, put that in the chat. We'd like to hear those examples, uh, learn from each other. So just take a few moments to think about that. That's a great point. Asynchronous provides a really great opportunity for a lot of those homework activities, some carryover things. Uh, that's a really good point. Situational pictures and problem solving, exercise programs for PT. God, this is some great information here in the chat. And kind of to follow up on our uh, session examples, so many great options um, for the kind of materials and, and things that we're able to send now uh, with the development of a lot of great materials within the last few years. 
speech homework for articulation, absolutely. Kind of that daily practice of those speech sounds, which is gonna just really help those students with that carryover. These are really great examples. Lots of good um, kind of thinking about both sides of that. Vocabulary list from teachers. That's a great way to pull in um, curriculum. Absolutely, with uh, with the staff members and and teachers that um, we're working kind of collaboratively with with our students. That's great. I like a lot of this, you know, synchronous thinking about these direct treatment activities and, and working on therapy goals. And then the asynchronous piece can really be that homework and, and carry over. Absolutely. Handouts, things like that. For all disciplines, this is great stuff. So we're going to test our knowledge a little bit now that we've thought about that and how it might look, you know, within our practices and in our disciplines. Asynchronous sessions do not require scheduling and happen on your own time. True or false? Give everybody a little bit of time to get those answers in. All right. And that answer was true for that um, last test your knowledge question. So talking after, now that we've talked about um, digital assets and what those look like, we do also need to check for digital literacy. The American Library Association's Di Digital Literacy Task Force um, has a definition, and they say that digital literacy is the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, evaluate, create and communicate information, which requires both cognitive and technical skills. So by definition, digital literacy is an individual's ability to use and understand the electronic digital world. For many students today, they have been using digital devices since early childhood and often teach us lots of things about um, what's out there. And they're familiar with using technology to gather information, communicate and create. When beginning your virtual practice, it is important to have an idea of the student's level of digital literacy. Are they familiar with the computer or tablet? Can they navigate the audio controls? And also with their assistant or e-helper, are they familiar with the settings and links to a, ses a session? So here's a few things that you would wanna check for. Um, do they have basic computer skills such as familiarity with functions of a computer, laptop or tablet? And so we're talking audio controls, USB port, webcam connectivity, and screen sharing? Is there familiarity with basic internet skills such as how to use a browser, access email, conduct a search and safety um, protocol session regarding spam or phishing? And it's a good idea to set up an introductory session to complete a tech check and introduce yourself to the client. You wanna verify that the client can access those controls and adjust them accordingly. Practice using headphones or Bluetooth listening devices and make sure that connectivity is good. Practice sharing visual stimuli. Um, you wanna make sure that the student viewing is viewing the item um, on a screen where they're, that's large enough for them to make out the things that you're sharing. Pearson, so uh, one of the assessment publishers, they recommend not using a screen smaller than 9.7 inches in diagonal. And by completing this introductory session, you can also determine if the client is actually a good candidate for teletherapy. Um, so, you know, if you're having your own practice or um, things like that, then you, you would want to make sure that your student is going to be able to access everything that they need to so that they can have a quality session. Or you may need to make sure that an, a facilitator or an e-helper is there with them to make that a, a quality session. 
This is also going to provide you with a sense of the client's environment and any possible distractions that may be present. So road noise, others in the room, public spaces. And I've definitely have had kids log in from the backseat of a car um, for a therapy session. So it's pretty difficult to do handwriting when you have trouble with that anyway in the car, but just kind of knowing, you know, what, what, are, what are the situations that you might find yourself in? In the same way that you work with a student, it's also a good idea to conduct a prep session with the facilitator or parent. You may need to provide additional training or support to make sure that they can access a webcam, headphones, or talk about seating arrangements for the student. Re review the confidential, uh, confidentiality policies with the facilitator and any other expectations that you may have regarding um, your session, and especially if you're going to be conducting an assessment. Um, it's important that they understand what they can and can't say for prompts um, and how they will need to, to, to help and facilitate. And if you are doing an assessment, talking about the different physical materials that may need to be available for that. So um, our next ask, test your knowledge question is about the digital literacy. And which of the following are key items to consider when evaluating a student's digital literacy? Familiarity with the computer or tablet, navigation of audio controls, familiarity with basic internet controls, ability to participate in prep or tech session, or all of the above. Great. And the correct answer is all of the above. We want to make sure that they're able to yeah. uh, navigate and um, understand these things. School-based services are those services provided when the student is accessing the session within a school setting. In the school setting, an e-helper or a facilitator is often made available to you at the school. And for students who are homeschooled, then your e-helper or facilitator is the primary caregiver. When working with the e-helper or facilitator, it's important to consider the digital literacy of the assistant as well as the student. Within the virtual environment, it's important to consider the tools needed for adapting the traditional hard copy forms to digital, as well as any therapy materials. When beginning a therapy or evaluation session for the student, parent consent is necessary to begin services. And for any legal documentation, such as that consent form, you'll need to utilize electronic signature software instead of a hard copy that you would normally use in an, an in-person situation. We'll talk about more uh, in our second webinar about the legal and ethical considerations for uh, telepractice. Um, if you are contracted with a local education agency or an LEA, they will often instruct you with their requirements and their procedures for electronic signature. Otherwise, if you are a private practitioner, you'll want to consider using a program that will provide you with a certified electronic signature. This secures that the document against any alterations or, or any ch changes. Um, it is also the certified digital, digital signature that is legally secure. For assessments that use um, manipulatives during an in-person evaluation, you'll need to consult with the test publishers regarding virtual administration and to see if there's any possible subtest substitutions. Many publishers are now providing updated assessments specifically meant for virtual administration. Many clinicians have embraced the use of creative technology to enhance their sessions from virtual games and playrooms to the use of green screens. We had a few examples earlier in this, this course. By utilizing and staying up to date with creative resources, you can keep your students engaged in your session. And then lastly, one of the greatest benefits of teletherapy is the opportunity for parents or caregivers to participate. 
Virtual services allow for increased parent engagement because they can remote in from anywhere. Parents or caregivers don't have to worry about travel time or taking time off of work to get to a meeting. And they often feel more secure during the inter interview process um, when it's done virtually. Uh, and they can provide more valuable insights or concerns about the home environment. They just have reported to feel more at ease when they're able to remote into those virtual meetings. And now we're going to talk about evidence-based practice here. Uh, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, or ASHA, defines evidence-based practice as a framework integrating external scientific evidence clinical expertise and client perspective to answer clinical questions and make informed decisions. ASHA's position states that evidence-based practice ensures high quality and individualized care. Likewise, the American um, School Counselor Association or ASCA defines evidence-based practice as professional wisdom combined with empirical evidence. Professional wisdom is the judgment clinicians have been acquired through their experience. The EBP school counseling model is the integration of using data, using outcome research, and evaluating intervention and programming. So in a broader sense, evidence-based practice includes three parts, researched evidence, client perspective, and clinical expertise. Developing clinical expertise is vital in all areas involving evidence-based practice, but especially in teletherapy. Not all evidence-based practices are effective in the teletherapy environment, so you'll need to rely on your professional wisdom for the appropriateness of your therapy model. By remaining current in evidence-based practice within your clinician community and utilizing research-based tools, you can enhance your overall clinical expertise. Lastly, an important piece of evidence-based practice is evaluating your practice by utilizing progress monitoring, pre and post assessments, and also goal development. Through a systematic scientific approach, you can assess if your therapy tools effectively meet your client's goals. So now we'll test our knowledge again here. Evidence-based practice includes three parts, researched evidence, client perspective, and we've got two choices here, clinical expertise, or practical knowledge. And we've got a little bit of time to make those choices. Clinical expertise. All right. You guys are getting these well. Next question here related to evidence-based practice. An important piece of evidence-based practice is evaluating your practice. You can do this by doing the following, except. So we've got some choices here, utilizing progress monitoring, pre and post assessments, goal development, and sending out evaluation forms to your students or clients. So we're going to evaluate our practice utilizing that progress monitoring, pre and post assessments, and the goal development there. And these are just some resources that contributed to this information that we shared with you today. These are also listed on your participant worksheet, but just so you're aware, these are some great resources to look at for additional information. Great, so that brings us to the end of the content for today's webinar.